welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be ranking all of the mainline Final Fantasy games. This video has been three years in the making. When I started this video, Rebirth was still in development and Final Fantasy 16 was well over a year away. And here we are. A couple notes here, we will not be ranking Final Fantasy 4 the after years, nor will we be ranking Final Fantasy 13 2 or Final Fantasy 13 Lightning Returns. As well, we won't be ranking either of the MMOs, Final Fantasy XI or Final Fantasy XIV, as I've not played them enough to be able to give them justice in this list. We also won't be including Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, Advent Children, Dirge of Cerberus, or any other spin-off of Final Fantasy VII I'm forgetting. As well, we won't be ranking remasters separately from the original games. I'll be ranking what is the most recent version of each game, in this case being PC editions of most of the games, as well as the pixel remasters. No GBA bonus content in this video, although I will touch on that in a later series. Without further ado, we will be ranking all of the mainline Final Fantasy games. Now, coming in at our number 16 spot, yes, there are 16 games on this list, we have Final Fantasy XIII. Final Fantasy XIII was released in March 2010 to an international audience and was actually the last game in the series to be released separately in Japan, with the Japanese release date coming in December 2009. Final Fantasy XIII stars Lightning, a former Guardian Corps member who is fighting to save her sister and eventually the world from political corruption and also, I guess, sort of an impending apocalypse that might be important. Part of the reason I don't want to rank the other two games in the trilogy is because there's always another apocalypse and another fate and another savior and another prophecy. Like, they got very creatively bankrupt just because they really liked Lightning and wanted to keep writing her. The other reason I didn't want to rank them is because I didn't play them and I have no immediate plans to nor do I really want to. And this game is why. Dear God. There are no bad games on this list, but man does this one come close. A lot of criticism of this game boils down to two things. The systems employed and the linearity. The paradigm system is not confusing. It is just bad. The Crystarium is also just a poor man's leveling system requiring absolutely no skill, strategy, rhyme, or reason. The story is just a mess, with most of the characters in the game being there just to be there. Their motivations are genuinely human and understandable at first, but later on they just boil down to save the world. Which is pretty neat, but my god, you could tell that the only character the writers of this game actually enjoyed writing for was Lightning, because she's the only development in this game. Except for Hope, who is unfairly criticized for being a crybaby. People tend to forget he's a literal child. Onto the linearity, which can be described very simply. Have you ever seen a really big tree where the trunk goes up forever and then there are about three branches near the top? I'm thinking like the opposite of a willow tree, maybe like a palm tree. Do, do palm trees have branches? Anyways, the story is just one big palm tree. You go from hallway to hallway fighting battle after battle against each area's individual enemy until you decide to go to the planet that your starting planet orbits. Then the developers of this game discovered the word field and all was right with the world. Except the field kind of sucked and lacked depth. Featuring a rigorous collection of side quests that all boil down to, Help, I died. Kill this monster for me. Also, I am now a floating brick wall. Ah! And so you kill the monster and get awesome rewards, such as 1,500 weapon experience worth of items, which is almost nothing if you're unaware, and sometimes you even get one useless accessory. Again, this is not a bad game. Lightning is awesome, the cutscenes and scenery are beautiful, the battle system is decent, and every time I play this game, the paradigm system gets a little less bad. It ranks at the bottom of this list for a reason, and this would be the only game on this list I consider somewhere below mid. Up next is number 15 on the list, which is Final Fantasy II. Final Fantasy II was released in 1988 and was released on the Famicom, also known as the Family Computer or FC in Japan but we know it in the West as the NES. The Pixel Remaster version was released July 28, 2021 on Steam as well as mobile game stores, later being released on the Nintendo Switch and the PlayStation 4. Final Fantasy II is a hard game to talk about because it's aged honestly like milk. It, many systems have been discovered to be exploitable due to the odd leveling system that this game uses. Rather than levels, the later job levels, or some kind of sphere grid, this game uses a system that rewards the players for what they do specifically, such as leveling up axes will increase your ability with axes, and leveling up swords will level up your ability with swords. Using the strength-based attack command will level up strength, and using magic will level up MP, 
the spirit or intelligence based on what type of magic you're using, as well as a dedicated magic stat that determines how much your MP will actually go up when it levels up. While a good system on paper, in execution there are a great deal of problems, such as exploiting hitting other party members to increase HP and strength, applying sap or osmos to take away MP, increasing the magic stat, or just straight up grinding at the beginning of the game to make the rest of the game a breeze, as there's nothing stopping you from adventuring into high level areas with low level magic, and leaving with Blizzard 9 for your first boss battles. The system is the very definition of a double edged sword, as a new player with no knowledge of the exploits may find it fun and refreshing, while an educated player or an experienced one may find it incredibly easy to abuse the systems and make themselves godlike before arriving in Finn. This is why the game ranks so low, as this system is pivotal to experiencing the game. There's no getting around it, there's no avoidance, nothing. You are going to experience this form of leveling, and you're going to like it. Or you won't, and you'll make it number 15 on your YouTube ranking video. Why does this game rank ahead of Final Fantasy XIII then? Well, the story is amazing, being a fun adventure and a tale of revenge, as 4, 3, 4, maybe it's only 3, who is Leon anyways? Teenagers adventure to topple an evil empire who is subjugating the world in an attempt to be evil, I guess. Little shallow, I suppose. Oh my bad, they're orphans, they're not teenagers. Big difference. I thought there was more depth to this story, but I'll admit when I'm wrong, this is just a Die Hard sequel where the bad guys die hard, come back as the ruler of hell, and the GBA version has a secondary story where you fight the split personality of the ruler of hell who is also evil. So I guess he's split into two evils. Nice. Just like Die Hard, the best Christmas movie. This game ranks so low due to the leveling system and the shallow story, but ranks above 13 because I'd rather have a shallow story and a bad leveling system over whatever the hell the Crystarium was pretending to be. Also, all four characters have the same depth, whereas the main six and 13 are lightning and five losers. I enjoy Final Fantasy 2 and would consider it the bottom of the mid section. Next on our list, coming in at the number 14 spot, is going to be Final Fantasy 15. I actively describe this game as my favorite game to hate, and you'll find out why shortly. Final Fantasy XV was released in November 2016, originally meant to be September 2016, about 10 years after it started development. Thanks, Nomura. The PC version was released a year and a half later, in March of 2018. One thing that will strike most players of the base version of Final Fantasy XV is that there is a lot of missing content. Now, granted, I don't think the base version of Final Fantasy XV exists in any playable form anymore, unless you have a PS4 with it downloaded. While there is no playable form of Final Fantasy XV available to download in its initial form, there is the Royal Edition, which is currently the baseline version, and there is the Windows Edition, which is the same thing, but for Windows computers. There are multiple events alluded to, a lot of gaps that are filled using backstory presented in other forms of media, multiple ghost stories of a second planned season pass, later downscaled to just episode Arden, as well as entire segments of the game where main characters just disappear and the blanks are not filled in without paid DLC. Yeah. Apparently it was planned to be that way. Which means as a launch product, Final Fantasy XV is just incomplete. And that's a problem. I have a lot to say about this game, but for the sake of this video, I'll keep it more brief than I'd prefer. In addition to being incomplete, the game is overly ambitious, featuring a fishing simulator, a photography simulator, and a camping simulator where you cook. While all of that would be amazing as smaller pieces of content, they're considered essential to the gameplay in many aspects, even taking up accessory slots and valuable time that could have been spent, I don't know, Making the DLC part of the actual story or something important like that, maybe? I don't know, I just work here, man. I just talk online about this stuff. But as a fan, this game was a massive letdown. So why does it rank above the other two games on this list so far? For one, as a complete package, including the numerous 28 patches that this game received, the Episode Gladio, Episode Ignis, and Episode Prompto DLC, the Alternate Chapter 13, the Episode Arden DLC, the Kingsglaive movie starring Aaron Paul, my beloved, the Brotherhood anime, and the second missing DLC pass that was turned into a book, Final Fantasy XV Dawn of the Future, and the entire multiplayer expansion Comrades, 
The game is actually pretty cool. While I'm not an avid connoisseur of action RPGs, this one does strike me as very interesting, being one of the few where it just feels like there's no stakes at all. I never felt in danger of dying, and I could just do high-level dungeons at the beginning of the game because I could just warp everywhere without being hit, and the holding circle to pretty much always dodge was amazing. As well, the side content of this game is so fun, featuring a fairly open world with optional dungeons, some of which have further portions unlocked later in the game, royal tombs, the aforementioned fishing simulator, there's just a lot to enjoy in this game. Unfortunately, that isn't enough to overturn this game as number 14 on this list in my opinion. I'll have further thoughts on this game at a later date, but let's move on for now. Coming in at number 13 on our list, we have Final Fantasy V. This is actually one of my least played Final Fantasy games, and I hope to change that in the future. Releasing in December of 1992 on the Super Famicom, or SNES, Final Fantasy V features four protagonists at first, those being Bartz, Lena, Galuf, and Ferris, later on replacing Galuf with Kryl. By the way, the game came out 32 years ago. If that's a spoiler, you need help. Final Fantasy V, along with 2 and 3, were originally not released in North America and caused quite a bit of confusion when they were released in collections for the Wonderswan and PlayStation. Actually, it's kind of interesting because Final Fantasy I was released as Final Fantasy I in the West, whereas Final Fantasy II and III were not released in the West at all. Final Fantasy IV was released as Final Fantasy II so that people wouldn't think that they missed two games prior, and Final Fantasy V was not released in the West for many years. Final Fantasy VI was released in the West, and it was released as Final Fantasy III to avoid confusion to the Western audience. Kinda strange. The story boils down to a lot of what made the first Final Fantasy iconic, in that several characters are thrown together by circumstance and united by a common goal. They go on an adventure where they help people and grow as warriors, followed by an epic showdown with God. In this case, a very evil tree. The differences are what make this game special, those being the job system and the characterization. The job system in this game is amazing and probably the best we will ever see provided in this series. Assuming that Final Fantasy XVII isn't a pixel game like some, myself included, would like it to be. Featuring 26 jobs, all with their own pros and cons, this game had a ton of customization for 1992. This wasn't your average RPG, this is the absolute top of the middle of the road. With that glowing review thus far, what brings this game down? Unfortunately, this game is simply a victim of its time. The game suffers from a lot of the same issues as Final Fantasy II, such as a pretty shallow story, odd pacing, as well as easy grinding, which results in one of the easier games in the series, and especially easier when you consider the other games from the Pixel Remaster collection. I personally also think a lot of the dialogue can be over the top, far too characterized, and when contrasted with the idea of several fearsome warriors embarking on a perilous journey to save the world, it really leads to a tonal mismatch. For those reasons, Final Fantasy V is number 13 on our list, and the top of what I consider the mid portion of this ranking. Coming in at number 12, we have Final Fantasy I. The Legendary series began with this, originally titled Final Fantasy, because there was simply no idea that there was going to be a Final Fantasy II. Uh, a common misconception about this game is that it was titled for any specific reason, and most people think that that reason is because Hironobu Sakaguchi was going to retire from game development if this game failed but in reality, it was just so they could abbreviate the title to FF. Initially, it was going to be called Fighting Fantasy, but they didn't want to infringe on the copyright of the existing tabletop game, as well as lacking the resources to challenge the copyright, so they just decided on Final Fantasy. Releasing in December 1987, this game features the four protagonists, the Warriors of Light. Though there is little backstory to these characters, you'll grow to love them as you watch them live and die for you to advance the story. Starting out, you fight Garland, and as a final boss, you fight Garland. Okay, his name at the end is Chaos, but come on, it's a time loop. Oh yeah, the game has time travel. Only two years after Back to the Future made it cool, and about 25 years before Kingdom Hearts completely ruined the concept in RPGs. Joking, of course, but a time travel video game in 1987 is completely amazing. In addition, the game is just straight up fun. The battles are fun, featuring monsters from the D&D series and magic spells you've come to expect from Final Fantasy, like fire, ice, and lightning spells. This was the start of it all, but did it start on fire? Well, yes and no. On one hand, you've got the iconic setup of everything we love today, minus what Final Fantasy II introduced. You have a game that was only originally bookended to sell 200,000 copies, when Sakaguchi himself begged them to make 400,000 copies. 
And in Japan, the game ended up selling 512,000 copies, even more than Sakaguchi himself predicted. And when the game came to the West, they ended up with 1.3 million units moved. That's pretty impressive, especially given the video game crash of the 80s. Thanks, Atari. On the other hand, the lack of characters with any development was insane, especially to where we are now. Again, it's aged like milk. As well, the gameplay is... alright, but it definitely wasn't the polished product that we got from later entries. And I will give them points for the sprite work, the coding, and the ideas, because for a team as small as what developed this game, I think it, at most it was ever 15 people working on this game at any given time, they really polished it quite well. A mixed bag of a game, I really love Final Fantasy 1, and I'll have more complete thoughts on it at a later date, but for this video, this comes in at number 12. Entering the fight at our number 11 spot, we have Final Fantasy 4. Releasing in July 1991, this is another of the games I do need to play more. Final Fantasy 4 set the standard for story in these games. Featuring a huge story with a rotating cast of characters, Final Fantasy 4 is an epic at its most true form. A twisting and turning narrative with betrayal, love, loss, pain, and what does it do to belong at the number 11 spot? Well, as a game with an amazing story, the gameplay is where it actually falls flat. This is the first game to feature the ATB system, and while that's cool, what isn't cool is the unchangeable characters, including the Dark Knight slash Paladin Cecil, our main character. There are no characters outside of him who can swap classes, and he only has two classes to swap from, which are basically light and dark versions of each other. This is a complete switch from the first three games, which feature characters who, while not always being swappable in-game, were at the very least able to be decided by the player. In this case, there is no ability to swap characters' classes, and this results in a fairly formulaic experience. And the worst thing you can throw at a Final Fantasy game is definitely making it formulaic, in my opinion. The rest of the game is definitely saved by the story and aspects of gameplay, but wow, does the formula bring it all down. Do I really think this is a bad game, though? God, no. I think this is a very good game. I may not have made it out so far to be that way, but wow, does the story pluck my heartstrings. Probably one of the best romance stories in the series, the game is also huge on the betrayal aspect, especially with the parts between Cecil and Kane. I think the story alone makes this game a top 5 in the series, but we aren't just ranking stories today, and the gameplay unfortunately can't take a back seat here. I think in time perhaps I'll appreciate it more, but right now, as it stands, this is our number 11 spot. Starting off our top 10, we have Final Fantasy VI. I know this game is a favorite for many, you have no idea how many articles I've read talking about how 6 is better than 7, 6 deserves a modern remake, 6 is the peak of series, etc, etc. But in my opinion, 6 is just a good game. It's not great, but that's not a problem. Releasing in April 1994 and featuring one of the largest casts of any Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy VI features Tara Bradford, a half-esper woman under the control of an evil empire. In this game, that empire is the Gestalian Empire, or the Magitek Empire, depending on, you know, who you talk to. Breaking free thanks to the previously useless thief class character, in this game being Locke, Terra begins gathering friends in order to bring down the empire and save the world. Except, in a cruel twist of fate, Final Fantasy VI would be the first in which the protagonists actually lose, like majorly. Not just getting wiped out or captured, Final Fantasy VI features the main party completely helpless, as the mastermind behind the Empire's atrocities, Kefka, would destroy the world and ascend to godhood well before the end credits roll. The second half of the game is a whirlwind, in which the knight Sellies has to regather her strength and the party members who have gone on with their lives in this new apocalyptic world of monsters and demons. Final Fantasy VI is beloved for many reasons, but one of the many reasons it falters in my opinion is the sheer complexity. Imagine, if you will, a spider web. On that web are several flies, and in this case the developers are the spider. A good web can hold many flies and allow for more food for the developers to sink their teeth into, but a bad web will either catch few flies or catch so many that it buckles under its own weight. In this case the latter happens, which results in a bloated game that seems to not know what it wants to do with its characters. While they are mostly altruistic, Outside of Sellies, they all seem to give up when they're defeated, rather than regrouping and fighting another day. 
This leads to a huge quest to regather them, but why were they not just ready to fight? Why did they lay down their arms for so long? The story in this case is a bit of a problem for me and brings this game down to the number 10 spot. The gameplay is very fluid and a very good use of the ATB system. In addition, the sheer number of characters means you don't really have to worry about some having someone to fill a job role, like a warrior, a mage, a thief, etc. Now, there are a great deal of characters in this game, all featuring roles with some overlap, such as uh, different types of mages, but all in all, you always have somebody to fill the role you're looking to have filled. This helps keep the game above the others and would be the last pixel game released in the main series until the Pixel Remaster series brought this and five other games back to the forefront of the conversation. Our number 10 spot, Final Fantasy VI. Coming in at number 9 on our list, and the only sequel to make this list, we have Final Fantasy X-2. I included this game not only in hopes of a Final Fantasy X-3 to round out the story, but also because I love it so much, and because it was the first direct sequel in the series. Also, I've played it many times, and I have much to say about it. Final Fantasy X-2 was released in March 2003, around two years after Final Fantasy X, and was received fairly well for its performances and gameplay, but not so much for the tonal shift from Final Fantasy X. Despite that, I personally greatly enjoy the game, and have come around from where I would have ranked it several years ago. The game is just fun. Featuring a largely peppy tone in the first all-female cast in a Final Fantasy, you follow the former summoner, Yuna, her cousin Riku, and newcomer Pain throughout a revamped Spira, where smiling has become the norm for the formerly tortured people. Yuna is adventuring at first to find Titus, or Titus if you're lame, but later discovers the plotting of a very similar looking man known as Shuyin, who wants to destroy Spira for what they did to Xanarkand, but mainly because of the death of his love Len. This leads to a game that features a surprising variety of activities, including matchmaking, minigames, creature collecting, blitzball but somehow worse, and a percentage rating that directly impacts the cutscenes of the game and the way things play out. This is one of the hardest games to get the true ending on that I have ever played, and all of my first playthroughs of Kingdom Hearts games were on proud mode. Yes, including KH2's Lingering Will. The gameplay has also changed from Final Fantasy X, now featuring an ATB system that has taken on a similar spin to the conditional time battle system from the aforementioned game, where the ATB now charges much quicker when you use certain moves, and takes longer to charge for moves that may be more powerful or useful. The game also features a twist on the job system, now featuring dress spheres that change your outfits and also your abilities to suit your needs. Rather than leveling up said jobs, you instead gain ability points for them to learn new abilities and level up through a traditional stat-based system. While I lament the loss of the sphere grid in this game, I do appreciate the simplicity of the systems presented. Do well and get lots of EXP and you'll be powerful. Do badly and you'll get curb stomped in the next month. Simple, right? So what brings this game down? Well, for one, the overwhelming openness of the game tends to be a contributing factor. There are a million and a half side quests that are necessary to get 100% in this game, and if you miss any, you deprive yourself of a touching ending. As well, try telling me you've completed this game 100% without a guide or a save percent checker on PC, and I will simply not believe you. <laughs> There's no way. You're a liar. Another factor that brings it down is the lack of character development for any of the main characters. It just kind of felt like they were all there for the journey. Nothing was gained, nothing was lost, and without the true ending, we're right back where we started at the beginning when we reached the end. Largely, though, the reason this game ranks low is just because it is good. It, it's not amazing. Nothing makes me want to run through a brick wall. It's just good. And that's okay. Final Fantasy X-2, number 9 on our list. Top 8, here we go. And we are kicking that off with Final Fantasy III, the last of the pixel remasters I have to talk about and my personal favorite of the first six games. In my opinion, this was the shining light of the pixel remasters, and a beacon of what I want a future pixel-based Final Fantasy game to look like, should one grace our presence. Released initially in April 1990, Final Fantasy III rounded out the Famicom trilogy with the Blom, featuring, again, four characters bound together by circumstance and fighting together to stop the end of the world, one of the first twists in this game is that the world isn't actually the world. Instead, the world, as our protagonist, and us to this point know it, is actually a floating continent on the actual world, which is beset by darkness due to, you may be able to guess this one, a being known as the Cloud of Darkness. 
Our protagonists adventure across the world in order to vanquish the Cloud of Darkness and bring peace to the world. Easy, right? This game features the first job system to be changed in-game, allowing players to acquire new jobs and change them outside of battle on a whim. It also features the return of the classic experience system, as well as the new staples introduced in Final Fantasy II, like Cid, Chocobos, Airships, and more. This is all fine and amazing in some cases, but where does Final Fantasy III fall flat? Honestly, in very few places. The story is a bit bare bones compared to the epics yet to come, and the setting is a bit too similar to those we'd already seen. A limitation of the time, but a limitation nonetheless. Compared to what was to come, this was a harbinger of the future, and a huge step in the right direction, even if there were some aforementioned missteps along the way. Final Fantasy III rounds out what I consider the good games, and thus ends our number 8 spot. Making its grand entrance to the PS1 era and the number 7 spot, we have the appropriately titled Final Fantasy VII. This game released in January of 1997, around 27 years ago from this video. Many people have this as their favorite Final Fantasy game, and it's pretty easy to see why. Featuring an amazing cast of fleshed out characters, an epic weaving story full of love, loss, intrigue, and aliens, Final Fantasy VII came at a time when the medieval style of games was going out of fashion. We didn't know it at the time, but the cultural shift of the 90s was devouring anything it could, and Final Fantasy VII would be no different. I would consider Final Fantasy VII to be the first mainstream Final Fantasy, as it was the first to be as successful as it was in the West, and seemingly took off overnight. In addition to the story, the gameplay is amazing, featuring the Materia system, an evolution of the job system, where abilities could be equipped without any requisite, then leveled up and executed in battle by any able-bodied, non-slain character. The only prerequisite to Materia was simply acquiring it, which could be as simple as buying it at the store, and as complicated as breeding chocobos, racing chocobos, and finally getting the perfect chocobo, or defeating a green super boss. Pick your poison. The overworld was also stunning, with numerous locales and different types of locations. The game is only helped by its graphics, which at the time were groundbreaking, and pushed the PS1 forward in terms of fidelity. Gone were the pixels, replaced by the polygon. My god, did those polygons shine. Final Fantasy VII starts off what I would refer to as the Great Tier, and was one of my favorite games. So what brings it down? For starters, the story. Many will go to bat for this, but I consider the story to be convoluted, unnecessarily backtracking, and complicated for the sake of uncomplicating later. You have the Cloud Isn't Cloud storyline, you have the Cloud is a Sephiroth clone storyline, you have the Tifa knew all along the Cloud wasn't right storyline, you have Zack, you have the story of Gast, Lucretia, Genova, and Falma. There's so many plot threads that the game stops and starts at many points, not to mention the tone is highly inconsistent as nearly immediately after the death of Aerith, 27 years ago, there is a surprisingly placed snowboarding minigame that makes you wonder what was going through the minds at Square when they were developing the start of Disc 2. This just lends to placing this game below some others, although it doesn't stop me from considering this game to be great. Final Fantasy VII is appropriately placed at spot number 7 on our list. The final six starts with another great, but not perfect game, that being Final Fantasy XII, which released in March of 2006. Many have referred to this game as Final Fantasy Star Wars, and I used to be inclined to agree, until I saw an amazing pro Jared video about Final Fantasy XII, and part of it was dedicated to why Final Fantasy XII is not similar to Star Wars, and that encouraged me not only to pursue content creation further than I already was, but made me question my own biases towards games, and being with or against the tide of public opinion. So thank you, Pro Jared. Final Fantasy XII features the magic number of six protagonists. The main character starting off is Vaughn, a street orphan who resents the evil empire for the death of his parents and the subjugation of his homeland. This in turn leads to his revenge campaign, which was initially to be under the radar as he attempts to steal something of value from the palace treasury, now under an imperial control. In his attempt to burgle the treasury, he is told off by his fellow street orphan named Pinello, but he doesn't heed her warning. Instead, he sneaks into the palace through the sewers, disguises himself as a volunteer, and sneaks into the treasury. He steals what appears to be a glowing stone of some sort and leaves the palace, but in doing so, crosses paths with a sky pirate known as Balthier and Fran. This sets into motion the adventure, with the characters of Princess Ash and Bosch joining the party later on. There is a lot to get into with this game, and someday I will, but for now, if you hi haven't played the game, I highly recommend that you do. 
I would consider the top six games on this list to be must-plays for anyone looking for something fun in the RPG genre. This game features the License Board, a highly customizable pathway to powering up players through a transaction of license points acquired from bosses and mobs alike. This system is an evolution of the Sphere Grid that is used in conjunction with traditional leveling to increase stats and provide a benchmark to compare players to enemies. Enemies of a much higher level will have their names marked in red to signal danger when venturing into unexplored territories. In addition, the license board dictates what equipment you can use, allowing you to spec your characters as you wish to create classes and subclasses as you wish. Want a heavy knight who can cast haste and berserk on himself and cure when needed? You can do that. Want a monk with a staff to summon a giant swamp man to swarm your enemies with a plague? Also possible. Personally, I prefer the original PS2 version of the license board rather than the international Zodiac job system or even the Zodiac Age re-releases system. That's just me, and I see both sides of the argument. In addition, the Gambit system is amazing and offers this game another way to stand on its own, as you can essentially make what someone in coding might call an if-then-else statement. You can basically program a character with ideas such as if one character's health drops below 50%, then they'll cast Cure on them, else they'll continue on to the next line of code. And with a system that runs constant checks to ensure there's no need to meet certain conditions prior, most battles in this game can be done without opening the menu. So, what holds this game back from being higher on this list? Honestly, not much. A huge thing for me that diminishes replayability is that once you have the Gambit system in full swing, the game essentially plays itself and feels like a walking simulator in some aspects. The one thing I would want from a Final Fantasy XII remake is simply more side quests. They gave us a beautiful world in Evil East, and I just want to explore it more. Also, the next game on this list are just better. Though this is not a bad game. I consider it the middle of the great tier. Now, rounding out the great tier and coming into our number five spot, we have Final Fantasy VII Remake, a remake so great it has to be classed by itself. While Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age did revamp its systems, it didn't change its story, completely revamp progression, and flesh out its systems to the point that the first three hours of the game make up an entire AAA release. That's what separates Final Fantasy VII Remake from the rest of this list. It released in April 2020 and was an entire generation's entry into the Final Fantasy mythos, as it repeated the mainstream success of the original. Following the story of the original to a degree, Remake tasks you with taking control of Cloud, a mercenary working with the eco-terrorists known as Avalanche, as a favor to your childhood friend Tifa. Along the way, you encounter a plot by what is essentially the government of Shinra to exploit people for more money, but also to find a rumored promised land, which would serve to have unlimited power and create much wealth for Shinra. You encounter a flower girl besieged by ghosts of your past, something which remains murky, and you grapple with the ramifications of your PTSD at the hands of the legendary warrior Sephiroth. This in turn creates a compelling narrative worth revisiting with a new lens. Final Fantasy VII Remake is more than just a fresh coat of paint. As opposed to covering up a blemish like most remasters set out to do, Remake decides to do away with the entire foundation, rebuild it in concrete, establish a basis for what they're building, build it, paint it, and open it up for business. Remake is such a labor of love that it's impossible to find an area of the game where the developers felt like they were being crunched, rushed, or were just unhappy with their work. Everything feels like an expansion of the concept that the original just couldn't handle, like fleshing out the side characters of Avalanche, the periodic side quests, and the trauma that Cloud is dealing with due to the meddling of Sephiroth. Honestly, with such a glowing review, I'd understand if you're wondering why this game is ranked number 5. In this case, Final Fantasy VII Remake is brought down by exactly what makes it so fascinating and a labor of love. For me, it is simply too expanded. There are too many side quests, too many fetch quests, and it feels bloated. This leads to several hours of the game feeling like a slog to me and makes an experience that, while epic in most regards, falls flat in the areas where it really needs to shine. If you're going to add content to a 23 year old game, it should be good content in my opinion, and if it's not, then why bother? This is what holds the game back from being in the upper echelon. It is a great game with an amazing combat system and the story changes are amazing, but the bloat is there and it's unavoidable in my opinion. That's why Final Fantasy VII Re Remake ranks in at number 5 and rounds out our great tier. Now, just for the record, these last four games are nearly interchangeable, and I have no reason one might rank higher than the other outside of the fact I just straight up like some of them more than the others. 
I wouldn't consider the top four to be a fluid list that changes based on preferences day to day, but rather which I played last, which do I hold an appreciation the most for based on my life events, most importantly, which do I fall asleep thinking about most often at the time. In this case, coming into our number four spot and kicking off the perfect tier, this spot belongs to Final Fantasy IX. It was released in July 2000 and was actually developed at the same time as another game on this list. I'll talk more about that later. It was the final game released in the Final Fantasy PS1 era and was considered by many to be a callback to a bygone era, with many of the characters being based on the job system of years before. Our main character is Zidane, a young man with a tail who just so happens to be the thief class in this game. He works with a group known as Tantalus, who portray themselves as a theater troupe, but in reality, work from the shadows as a thief organization. Their latest target? Princess Garnet Till Alexandros, heir to the throne of Alexandria and the princess of one of the main continents of the Mist Continent of Gaia. This game was also returned to form in the setting, taking place in the planet of Gaia and featuring a very medieval slash steampunk sort of era. The game has a main cast full of depth, including Vivi, the Black Mage, Steiner the Knight, Iko, the Summoner slash White Mage, Quina, the Blue Mage, I pronounce it Quina, so just deal with it, as well as Garnet slash Dagger slash Sarah, the other Summoner slash White Mage. And finally, Amaranth, the monk who also dabbles in some abilities previously attributed to ninja classes, like the throw ability. Every one of these characters has a motivation, a reason for sticking together, as well as a reason to fight the evil they seek to defeat, that being Kuja, the evil twink from another planet. A huge feature of the Final Fantasy games is the different leveling system, and this one is no different, featuring levels 1 through 99 of traditional levels, as well as a new weapon slot based system akin to the Materia system. But instead of slotting Materia, the weapons have their own slots with their own abilities that every weapon with the same name shares. For example, you can buy more than one broadsword, but all of them will come with the capacity to learn Beast Killer. Once abilities are learned from weapons, they can be equipped with magic stones that increase as you level. There are a finite amount of these stones, which in turn leads to a sense of budgeting that most other Final Fantasy games fail to strike a balance in. Along with the leveling system, the game also features several fun side quests, including the Coffee side quest, Tetra Master, Chocobo Hot and Cold, Foot Races, Jump Rope, Friendly Monsters, and even Stellatio coins based on the star signs. Go to PlayOnline.com to learn more. The story of this game is intricate and features lots of self-evaluation from all characters involved. One cool thing about this game is that every character has growth and gets better as a person as the game goes on. Everyone grows and learns from their mistakes, their actions, and the actions of those around them. Again, what sets this game back is no fault of its own, it just isn't as good to me as the next three on this list. Final Fantasy IX kicks off the perfect tier with a bang, and ranks at number 4 on our list. This next one is a doozy. Final Fantasy XVI is number 3 on our list, and my god did this game change my life. The first Final Fantasy release I got to experience as an adult on launch day, Final Fantasy XVI was released in June of 2023 and was the third in the mainline series to be an action RPG, following in the footsteps of Final Fantasy XV and Final Fantasy VII Remake. XVI follows the story of Clive, a soldier in an unknown army whose backstory is revealed to us early on. He was the shield of his younger brother Joshua, a sickly child who was to house the power of the icon Phoenix. However, before the Phoenix could be awakened in Joshua, the same unknown army that Clive finds himself a part of storms the area and kills Joshua and Clive's father. Enraged, Joshua calls upon the power of the Phoenix and transforms in order to exact revenge on the army. This leads to another icon manifesting nearby and taking the fight to the Phoenix. A second fire icon was nothing more than a myth, but this creature brutally and unabashedly defeats Phoenix slash Joshua before pulverizing what appears to be his corpse as Clive screams and swears revenge. We flash back forward to Clive as a soldier in this army, now known to us as the Sandbrack Army. He encounters the dominant for the icon Shiva, known to him as Jill, his ward from when he was younger. They join forces along with the dominant of Rama, Sid, to take down the Mother Crystals, the source of magic and icons, but also the source of a mysterious blight overtaking the land. Final Fantasy XVI released to overwhelmingly positive reviews, a welcome turnaround after the disappointment that was Final Fantasy XV, and personally, I greatly enjoy Final Fantasy XVI. Not only for the cast, Ben Starr is a god by the way, voice of Clive. That's why I became his shield! To help bear the weight! 
But what did you do? You betrayed your own blood and surrendered your son to his fate! As is Ralph Ineson, voice of Sid. Clive. For so long, I thought I had all the answers. But then I met you. And I learned it wasn't a good death we should be fighting for, but a better life. It's all very well, a man reclaiming his fate. But if he can't choose how he meets it, what's the point? The game's combat, as mentioned prior, is action-oriented and features much less of the RPG elements early on in contrast with most of the games on this list. The leveling system is straightforward, featuring traditional levels as well as ability points to develop iconic powers and abilities as the game progresses. The enemies are all callbacks to the series, featuring Marlboros, goblins, corals, and all manner of creatures and beasts, including automatons. The setting is very medieval, taking inspiration from Game of Thrones as well as taking criticism from Final Fantasy XV to heart, including several things I touched on earlier, like the open world and lack of linearity, to instead create an experience unrivaled by very few in the genre. I absolutely love this game and treasure it with my whole heart. The only thing setting this game at number three on my list is the fact that the other two games are simply more favorite to me. And that's not a bad thing at all. Final Fantasy XVI is nearly a flawless game, and I can't wait to talk about it more. Coming in at our number two spot, we have Final Fantasy VIII. Final Fantasy VIII was released in February of 1999, and was the middle child of the PS1 era of mainline games. Many consider this game to be one of the black sheeps of the series, along with Final Fantasy II. Final Fantasy VIII features child soldiers, who apparently all grew up in the same orphanage, which is odd because they aren't all orphans. But hey, that's just a fact. A confirmed set in stone fact. Huh. I thought there was something else there. Anyways, our main child soldier in this game is Squall Lionheart, the coolest named protagonist possibly ever. Squall is uninterested in most things other than combat, seeking to prove his worth and be better than his main rival, Cypher. These child soldiers all attend a child soldier training academy known as Balam Garden, where they train and attend classes. At the beginning of the game, the final exam's prerequisite for some of these students is a fight with the local fire god known as Afreet. Afterwards, the first mission and final exam for these students is live wartime combat in the town of Dalit, under siege from the Galbadian army. Jesus Christ, this game is dark. Setting the story aside, let's explore the leveling. Final Fantasy VIII also features traditional levels, in addition to a controversial system known as the Junction System. For every one person you meet that likes this system, you'll meet about seven more who despise it and everything it stands for. Hi, I'm the one guy who likes it. Essentially, you draw upon the magic that monsters and other enemies have and use it to bolster your own stats, as well as safe keep it to cast later. Magic can also be refined from cards, items, and other forms of magic. It's actually amazing how open the game is in terms of ways to bolster your stats, as traditional leveling just doesn't do the trick in this one. One thing I've not touched on in most other games is the difficulty curve and the amount of grinding the game requires. This game is different from every other one in the series in that you can actually level up the monsters in the world by leveling up yourself. This directly impacts what magic is available to be drawn from enemies, resulting in the ability to be level 100 before the tutorial of the game ends due to the ease of combat in this game as well as the exploitability of the junction system. This is directly why I love it. The system is exactly as smart as you are. Certain spells contribute to different stats in different ways, as defensive magic like Protect and Shell can increase your physical resistance and magic resistance respectively, and spells like Cure and Regan can exponentially raise your health. Different spells correspond to different stats in different ways, and all of this is influenced by what guardian forces you equip, the game's equivalent of summons from the prior games. However, in this case, said guardian forces change what abilities you can equip and learn, what supporting abilities you have, and what stats you can junction magic to. This system just tickles a part of my brain I can't entirely explain, and I enjoy it immensely. The monsters are also some of the oddest we've seen in the series, featuring some very strange enemies, such as Garo Garo, Jumbo Cactar, Diabolos, Norg, the Elastoid, the Fungwar, the Slapper, and Bell Hellmel, just to name a few. 
This and more, combined with what I've mentioned prior, make this one of my favorite games ever, and round off the middle of the perfect tier of these games. But there is one game that rises just ever so slightly above this one, and I think you may be able to guess what it is. Final Fantasy VIII ranks in at number 2 on our list. Now, the number 1 spot. To recap, we've discussed nearly every single game in the mainline Final Fantasy game series, but there's one I haven't talked about. One of the three mainline games from the PS2 era, the final game on our list and the number one spot goes to Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X was released in July 2001 and was actually developed at the same time as Final Fantasy IX and XI. Final Fantasy X was the first to be released on the PS2 and wow was it groundbreaking. The game features voice acting for the first time in the series, as well as the conditional turn-based battle system, or CTB system. This system would only be featured in this game for some reason, and was remarkable in that certain moves would move your turn forward in the queue, or backwards depending on the move. For example, a move like Quick Hit would make your next opportunity to strike come much quicker, whereas a status effect like Slow would make the character's next turn come much slower as the name would imply, and would be illustrated for you to see in the upper right hand side of the screen. In addition, the sphere grid I've mentioned a few times made its debut and only appearance here, making traditional leveling leave in favor of a system based on traversing a grid that allows you to use spheres to activate nodes that give abilities, spells, and stats to power up your characters. In fact, the leveling system is so integral that a new, no experience run in this game is possible with absolutely no modding. Instead, it just requires you to not utilize your sphere levels and can be completed on any console the game is available on. Which is awesome, because the more challenge runs you can do with the vanilla game, the better. Next up, the characters of this game are all fleshed out and have distinct motives, yet are united by a common goal. This allows them to feel relatable and anyone can feel seen by their inclusion in the game. Whether that's the stoic Orin, the devout Waka, or the fish out of water Titus. Yes, Titus, not Titus. Part of what makes Titus such a good character is the in-universe explanation for why everything is being explained to you, since there's a phenomenon in which the evil space whale that tortures the people of Spira has a toxin, where if you survive his attack, you may be afflicted and suffer from amnesia. So everyone in-universe is just helping Titus get back to speed, rather than explaining this stuff to him for the first time. Which brings me to the story. This is your story. A young Blitzball player from the city that never sleeps, Xanarkand, is brought to the world of Spira, where Xanarkand is considered a religious site of a great war a thousand years ago, and is now destroyed. As Titus comes to terms with this, he is whisked up in the pilgrimage of the summoner Yuna, hailing from the island of Besaid. He journeys with her to recover his memory, but also because he has no other choice. He was brought in by her surrogate brother, Waka, and is encouraged to continue playing Blitzball in order to find someone who might know him. Along the way, Yuna and Titus find a common connection, Jekt, the man who accompanied Yuna's father, also a summoner, on his pilgrimage ten years prior. Jekt also disappeared from Xanarkin ten years prior while training for Blitzball out at sea, and just so happens to be Titus' father. What a coincidence! Just when Titus starts to believe that the Jack Yuna speaks of can't possibly his father, just a man with the same name, his mentor and surrogate father figure Orin arrives, and tells him Jack is one and the same, and they must journey to find him and put an end to Sin, the space whale terrorizing Spira and responsible for Titus's journey from Xanarkand. Wait a minute, from Xanarkand? Anyways, those are the bones for our story, and wow does this game have a story. Interesting fact, as of the recording for this video, the speedrun world record for this game sits at 8 hours and 28 minutes, but using the community tool, the Final Fantasy X cutscene remover, the current speedrun record sits at 3 hours and 1 minute, a whopping 5 hours and 27 minutes shorter. Which means effectively there are 5 hours and 27 minutes of unskippable cutscenes in this game, barring the use of any tools. Wow. Like I said, Final Fantasy X is full of story. So why is this game my favorite? Well, for starters, it's easily my favorite game of all time, matched only in the complete opposite end of the RPG spectrum by Elden Ring. Second, I have thousands of hours into this game, across PS2, PS3, PC, and even the PlayStation Vita. So when I say I know this game, trust me, I know this game. Outside of speedruns, of course. Maybe someday. Third, the side content. 
Many consider this game to be tedious, but I consider it quite the opposite, and I find it to be very fun and compelling to do side content. Not only does it flesh out the world, but it also offers a break from the dreary state of the world of Spira. So, who wouldn't want to take a few minutes to race chocobos, capture monsters, find ultimate weapons, hunt cactars, or even play Blitzball? Yes, I am a Blitzball enjoyer, and no, I will not apologize for it. Finally, and this is personal, when I was a kid, I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, my family had a PS2, and when I got grounded for something stupid I had done, rather than take away the PS2, my dad offered me a deal. Pick one game to keep, and the rest would be locked up. At my mom's suggestion, I picked Final Fantasy X. I played that game non-stop for the next several months, and even when I got the rest of my games back, I still kept playing Final Fantasy X. I've been playing this game for years, and I think I'll always be intrinsically linked to it. I mean, the game came out a month before I was born, and four months after I was born in North America. I can keep track of my age by how many years it's been since Final Fantasy X came out, and that's a fact I can hold on to forever. So, later this year, I'll toast to Final Fantasy X when we both leave our Taylor Swift year and turn 23. As I said at the start, this video took me three years to make. Life happens, and so much of my life has changed in those years. I genuinely can't believe where I'm at now compared to where I was then, and I just want to thank everyone who watched to this point, and I invite you to discuss your personal rankings in the comments, please leave feedback on this video whether you liked or disliked it, and real quick, let's go over the rankings once more. Coming in at number 16, we have Final Fantasy XIII, followed by Final Fantasy II, Final Fantasy XV, Final Fantasy V, Final Fantasy I, Final Fantasy IV, Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy X-2, Final Fantasy III, Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy XII, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy XVI, Final Fantasy VIII, and finally, Final Fantasy X. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you all.